Good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Michael Weber. I'm Chief Technology Officer at Energy Impact Partners. So I help with the technical sourcing and due diligence. And I'm also a professor at the University of Texas at Austin. I teach classes on entrepreneurship and thermodynamics. I thought I'd make a couple comments of the way I see it as a professor and a technical guy at, uh, at EIP about the trends going on in the energy transition, but also the opportunities for innovation that we see. So let's make a couple comments about that. And uh, there are a couple numbers to keep in mind, but I, I like to sort of to remember six, three, two, and four. So there's six demographic trends and three technology trends and a two-sided challenge I want to talk about that I think shape the energy transition that we're all active in. And those six demographic trends are population growth, economic growth, urbanization, industrialization, electrification, and motorization. Those are the six demographic trends around the world that are really shaping what's happening with the energy system. And fundamental to that is population growth and economic growth, especially globally. There are more people, and as there are more people, they want energy and water and soil and food and a high quality of life, and we have economic growth. And so as we have more people driving up demand and those people are getting richer and that compounds the growth, this means upward pressure on demand for everything we care about in a modern society. That's the most fundamental set of demographic trends that we have to deal with as an industry, as people, as a, as a society. But at the same time, we still have urbanization, industrialization. So we have people moving from rural areas to cities or from farm to factory. So it's changing where we use energy or what we use energy for. When people are in an energy poverty situation in some of these poor communities, you think like Southeast Asia or Latin America or Sub-Saharan Africa, energy is used for cooking and heating. It might be like straw or cow dung or wood or some like less sophisticated fuel. But as they move into factories, they're using that energy not just for heating and cooking, but for economic activity and for access to prosperity. So that has this benefit for themselves and for everyone in the society. So that's changing where and how we use energy. And then as people get rich, the fuels of the rich are mobility or motorization and electricity. Electricity is the preferred fuel of the rich because we use electricity for different things. Namely, we use it for climate control, for air conditioning, for food preservation, for water treatment, and all the technologies and lighting and things that we're benefiting from today. So electricity is the fuel that rich people want. It's also the sign that you are rich is if you have access to electricity. If you increase access to energy, people get richer. But at some point, access to more energy, you don't get richer. Your, your, your GDP doesn't keep growing as you use more energy because you have some other effects from that energy use. But electricity consumption and wealth are very well correlated. You can use electricity to get rich, and then when you're rich, you want electricity for the high quality of life. So those are the six trends that really drive the system. And it seems, it really means that everything's changing. We're changing how much we use, what we use it for, where we use it. And that means everything's changing in transition. And this is kind of interesting because that's the theme of the day or theme of the decade is energy transition. But I would also suggest to you that energy change is the one thing that's constant for the energy sector. It has been changing for hundreds of years. So the idea of change is new, but it feels like we enter these periods of accelerated change where a lot of things are happening at once. It feels like we're in one of those periods right now. And we've had them before with both industrial revolutions, the uh, rise of gasoline and mobility after World War II, the rural electrification. So we've had these periods of accelerated change. Feels like we're in one of them again, partly because of those six demographic trends really driving up demand for energy. We also have three technology trends happening at the same time wrapped up within those six demographic trends. The first is a trend towards increasing efficiency. Our goods and services are made with less energy and less mass than they used to be made. Our light bulbs are more efficient, our air conditioners are more efficient, cars are more efficient. Everything's becoming more efficient and that is one of the macro trends or mega trends, technologically speaking, that's addressing the need for more energy from the six demographic trends. So increasing efficiency is a good news story and is part of the technology mega trend we're dealing with, or benefiting from, I should say. The second mega trend is increasing information intensity of the energy sector. We're using more data. We, and we see that with the, some of the startups that Kevin mentioned. Like, so there's a lot of people using machine learning or artificial intelligence or more data to run things better. And in fact, it's the rise of information intensity that helps enable the decreasing energy intensity of that first trend. The first efficiency trend is enabled by an information intensity trend. So these trends kind of go hand in hand. So first trend is energy efficiency. Second trend is increasing information intensity. The third trend is increasing decentralization or decreasing centralization. I don't know how to say it. It's almost like a double negative or something. We're designing our power sector with more small things and more places like you already heard about Enchanted Rock and there are others. But this is a complement, not a replacement for the way we run the system today. But instead of just large power plants far away, we will have large power plants far away and small power plants close by. But this is also true for water. We're having more distributed water harvesting and treatment. It's also true for factories with the rise of 3D printers. Instead of having a factory far away, we'll make our things on our desktop at home. This is also true for hospitals. Instead of having a hospital, which is kind of like a factory for medicine, we'll have telemedicine. 
to go to a more decentralized system. And I would say EIP, we also have decentralized work. Our research team lives like in six different states, so for example. So we have a decentralization as another trend. And those three technical trends of increasing efficiency, increasing information intensity, increasing decentralization on top of the six demographic trends means everything is changing within energy all wrapped up in the two-sided challenge. And the two-sided challenge is, how do we increase access to energy for the billion people who don't have it around the world, especially the billion people who don't have access to electricity, while decreasing the impacts for the seven billion who do have it? So seven billion of us have access to energy, we need to reduce our impacts while increasing access for the billion who don't have it. And this notion that some people put out that we must use less because of climate change, whatever it is, leaves out that there's a billion people who must use more. And we have like an ethical, moral imperative to solve that. So we have to increase access while decreasing impacts. That's the two-sided challenge. Just using less is the answer. It's gonna have to be, let's use what we have more intelligently with the data and with more efficiency. And let's make sure we think about equitable access to the good solutions so that we can get people off of cow dung or solid woods that are already killing four to seven million people prematurely every year from indoor air quality pollution. So we have a problem where the billion people don't have access to energy and millions who die prematurely because they have primitive fuels. Let's get them better energy. So that's the two-sided challenge. And I think that's all like the six demographic trends and the three technology trends and the two-sided challenge sets us up for a need for innovation. So let's talk about innovation. What are the sort of priorities we should have for how we're gonna solve the deep decarbonization challenge? How are we gonna get the economy to net zero by 2050 or whatever the date is for you? And the way I think about it is there's a four-step priority list. The first step is efficiency and conservation. Let's reduce the height of the hurdle we must clear through efficiency and conservation. A lot of utilities are already doing this, and this is the most important thing we do. It's actually, frankly, difficult to invest in as a venture capitalist. There are not as many obvious venturable deals in efficiency and conservation. It's less sexy, gets fewer headlines, but there are opportunities, but there are programs that we can do around efficiency. And I lived in Europe for a while. I was chief science and technology officer for ENGIE for a few years, so I was based in Paris. Yep. Europe has a very different view on efficiency than the United States. And so they use about less energy, but half, uh, half as much energy per person in their buildings than Americans do. So we can do a lot, say, with efficiency and conservation. But that's the first step. The energy you don't use is the cleanest kind of energy. And we have to figure out the business models and the regulations and the markets and technology is an opportunity there. The second technical priority, I guess, to solve deep decarbonization is electrification. We should electrify as much as we can. Right now, electricity is responsible for like 40% of the primary energy in the United States, and Europe is like 35%. There is room for that to double or more. So that could go to say 80% or whatever it is. There are a lot of things we can electrify that would improve our pathway, our acceleration towards a lower carbon future. And light duty vehicle transportation is an obvious one. You saw the alley out there with the trucks and the cars. Electric vehicles are cleaner because they're plugging into a grid that's getting cleaner with time. But also that helps reinforce that first trend of efficiency because electric motors are like 85 to 90% efficient and a gasoline engine is like 20% efficient. So so electric vehicles get you efficiency and the decarbonization. I just took delivery of my electric vehicle I mean, a month ago. I love I'm it, I'll never go back. I, mean, I, I, don't, I think gasoline <laughs> engines are basically over except for some niche applications. And the thing that's unique about my Mach-E Mustang that I just got, which I love, is that my car will probably get cleaner over the 10 to 15 years I own it. Whereas my gasoline Ford, which I also have, has been getting dirtier for 10 or 15 years because as you run a gasoline or combustion engine car, they get dirtier as they wear down. But electric cars get cleaner because they're plugged into a grid that's getting cleaner. So it's interesting. We can have the same idea as we couple other sectors like agriculture or industry or heating or cooking, the electrified power sector, We'll get these benefits. So first step, it really should be conservation efficiency. Second step is electrification. We should electrify as much as possible, but we can't really electrify everything very easily. There are some parts of the economy that are difficult or expensive to electrify. I'm thinking aviation, industrial chemicals, industrial heat, some long haul shipping. So we need green fuels as a third part. And the green fuels could be the same gas we've always used, but with carbon capture. It could be biogas, it could be hydrogen, it could be hydrogen and gas blends, it could be hydrogen carriers like ammonia, formic acid or methanol or something, or it could be just whatever gas you've always used with a, a carbon scrub or somewhere else record capture. So we'll need green fuels for the part of the economy that we can't electrify 
electrify. Although, frankly, we could use electricity to make those fuels with e-fuels and electrofuels, and we ran some experiments on that in Paris when I was there with NG. So this is another way to go about it. And that sets up the fourth technical requirement as a list, starting with efficiency and conservation, electrification, green fuels, carbon management is the fourth step, especially carbon removal to take carbon out of the atmosphere for the parts that we emitted wherever it was from agriculture or land use or energy to get us to net zero. And those become like the investment pillars for us in many ways. When you think about energy impact partners, we're investing in efficiency, we're investing in data, we're investing in electrification, we're investing in green fuels, we're investing in carbon removals and all the technologies that support that suite. That's the way we think about the future and that's the way I think about the future and that sets us up. So we need those innovations along those four criteria, those sort of four priorities of efficiency, electrification, green fuels and carbon removals. But here's the bad news is Actually, the energy sector, despite how innovative it is and how much we invest collectively in research and all the STEM people and engineers and scientists involved with it, the energy industry moves slowly. The transition from one dominant fuel, wood, to coal took millennia. Coal was dominant in the United States from 1885 till 1950 when petroleum took over as the number one fuel. Petroleum has been dominant since 1950 to 2022. Natural gas might overtake it maybe this year, maybe next year. Natural gas will be dominant for a while. It takes a while for us to transition from one fuel to another. It can also take a while to transition to technologies. Incandescent light bulbs have been around for quite a while. Now we went through fluorescence, but just for like a decade or two, now we're on to LED. So we can do a technical substitution here and there maybe a little faster than we do the fuel substitutions. But if you back up in time and look at how we run our economy today and when those technologies for our economy were invented, it actually is cause for concern because 60% of the world's primary energy is converted through four devices, the gas turbine, the steam turbine, the gasoline engine, and the diesel engine. 60% of the world's energy goes through those four devices. The other 40% goes through boilers and burners cooktops, stoves, which have been around for thousands of years. But those four devices, the two turbines and the two internal combustion engines, invented as recently as 1893 with the diesel engine, the gasoline engine and the steam turbine in the late 1800s, the gas turbine in 1791. We are running the modern economy on old technology we're due for another innovation. So there's other stuff we consider. Maybe wind turbines, first demonstrated in the late 1800s. Maybe a solar cell, demonstrated in 1893. Maybe a fuel cell with hydrogen, demonstrated in 1839. In fact, if you read the book Phantom of the Opera, there's a whole scene in there which takes place in the opera in Paris in the late 1800s. They talk about using hydrogen and methane blends to change the brightness of the lamps at the opera to brighten up uh, the different performers' faces. So even the idea of hydrogen gas blends we talk about for our gas infrastructure has been proposed for over 130 years. The idea of all of them, they've all been around. Uh, James Prescott Jewell, 1839, suggested that electric vehicles would replace heat-based or steam-based machinery. So we finally have electric vehicles almost 200 years after he said that. The idea of using wind to make fuels, we talk about electrofuels, wind power to make electrofuels, hydrogen, that's exciting. The Dutch in the 1700s used windmills to crush oil seeds to get oil that they would burn for heat and cooking and illumination. So I was like, man, it feels like there's not a new idea under the sun. And this is the challenge is we need to accelerate innovation because we're running the world economy on some old ideas, it's time for some new ideas. Some of the things you're hearing about artificial intelligence data, those are new ideas, so there's some opportunities there. And the question becomes, how do we accelerate innovation? Well, the energy sector is unique because we innovate all the time, yet we're slow. Like, we're simultaneously fast and slow, but we also don't always operate the way people think we operate when it comes to innovation. So here's the story you'll be told about how innovation goes in the United States. Some scientist toils in the lab for decades and comes up with some new theory, some new science, and they publish it. And then an applied scientist will apply it in the lab, and that takes a decade or two. And then they'll hand it to the engineers. The engineers will improve it somehow in the lab. Then it goes to an entrepreneur who does like a benchtop prototype, and then they do a field-based prototype, then they do industrial scale prototype, then they deploy it at a commercial scale, and that whole process is three to five decades from idea to being out in the field. Do you think of like the internet or some of these different things that were invented in the lab as an idea, but took decades to become like a real accessible product for people? So this is the process we're told innovation follows. It's very linear, from brilliant scientist to industrious engineer to large-scale industry that will do deployment and commercialization. But in fact, the history of energy goes backwards sometimes. If you go back to the Industrial Revolution, it didn't work that way. 
You had tinkerers like Newcomen or Savory or James Watt who would build these steam engines and steam turbines and other devices and they would make it work and they figured out that they could use higher pressures or temperatures or better alloys that could withstand these conditions to get better performance. They knew they could do these things to get better performance because they just deployed it and tried it. But they didn't know why it worked. The science of thermodynamics was invented as a field to explain why the engineering worked in the field. So they had the devices working and didn't know why. And then the scientists, Sadi Carnot or other people who thought about the science, came along and developed the thermodynamics. They, they developed the explanations after the fact. We already knew it worked, but we didn't know why. And I know that because I teach thermodynamics, so I sort of walk my students through this. I was teaching the first or second law of thermodynamics. So these laws were developed after the fact to explain what we saw around us. And we really learned it out in the field, developing steam pumps or whatever it was to get water out of coal mines. It was necessity as the mother of invention. And so this really sets up the question, if energy every once in a while innovates backwards, if it doesn't start with science to applied science to engineering to prototypes to deployment and commercialization, what do we do? We should start at deployment. We should go backwards. And so what I would like to leave you with is the idea that we should just deploy as quickly as possible. Let's see what works then let's go back and figure out why it worked. And we gotta, we gotta move faster. And I think that's an important idea because sometimes we're like, no, we can't deploy the wind turbine until we get the perfect wind turbine. Or we can't deploy a battery until we get the perfect battery. But if you look at what's happened with solar panels and wind turbines and battery costs, they've dropped 90 or 95% in the last few decades. They didn't drop that much because the science improved so much, although the science did get better. They dropped so much because we deployed so many of them and that improved the manufacturing processes, that improved the supply chains. We just kind of figured it out and they helped drive down the cost. So if we really want to drive down the cost of solutions, we better get going. And that means from the Energy Impact Partners perspective, we need to deploy capital. From the entrepreneur's perspective, you need to deploy innovations. From the government policy makers, you need to deploy new policies. And then for the energy incumbents, all of you that, that Fitz was talking about earlier, we need you to deploy at scale because you're the ones who can do commercialization at scale. So in the end, it's a deployment game. And I know Jigger Shaw's coming to speak later, so I feel like I stole his line. I totally agree with Jigger. He talks a lot about we need to deploy. And I would say not only do we need to deploy, but deployment is the way we learn. It's the way we drive down costs. And actually, it is the way we have innovated in the history of energy. It is consistent with who we are and how we do things. Like, let's get it figured out. And let's just go do it and we'll, we'll experiment. So that's kind of the grand picture. It drives sort of some of the investment thesis for Energy Impact Partners. How do we deploy? What technologies? What are our pillars? How do we work with our partners, our investor companies, or our portfolio companies? You heard some of the names like Enchanted Rock for decentralized solutions or GridX and others. And we got Zap talking about clean energy with fusion. So we, we're thinking about that. And we're just one piece of the whole thing. I guess the last comment I'll say is there's a lot of partners. No one entity, no one city, no one state, no one country can solve a problem this big. So in the end, it's going to have to be deployment from everyone and a lot of collaboration, So, which I think is what EEI is good at, right? bringing people together to collaborate. So I'll stop there. I really appreciate your time. We'll be seeing you in the halls and during the different presentations. We hope to see you at our reception tonight. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I'm happy to sort of answer any questions offline, but I think I'm done. I see Brian walking up. So thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate it. Thanks, Brian.